reading, of course, from the King James Bible, the real Bible. You're going to need a King James Bible because you're going to need the actual, accurate, real reading of some of the scriptures we're going to be looking up. <clears throat> Proverbs chapter 16 is where we're going to begin. We're going to be reading, we're going to do some bouncing around here today. We're going to be going through a few scriptures. Proverbs chapter 16, beginning at verse 16 on to verse 19. We read in Proverbs 16, beginning at verse 16 on to verse 19. How much better is it to get wisdom than gold, and to get understanding rather to be chosen than silver? The highway of the upright is to depart from evil. He that keepeth his way preserveth his soul. Verse 18 and 19. The focus of this video today. Pride goeth before destruction, and an haughty spirit before a fall. Haughty, arrogant, flippant. Verse 19. Better it is to be of an humble spirit with the lowly than to divide the spoil with the proud. Let's read verses 19, 18 and 19 again. Pride goeth before destruction, and a haughty spirit before a fall. Better it is to be of an humble spirit with the lowly, than to divide the spoil with the proud. Hmm. Now turn to Proverbs chapter 6. Today is the sixth day of March. There are 31 days in this month. How many Proverbs are there? 31. Read a proverb a day, okay? Proverbs chapter 6, verses 16 on to verse 19. Oh boy! Ah, coincidence, huh? <laughs> Those don't exist. Proverbs chapter 6, verses 16 on to verse 19. We begin. These six things doth the Lord hate, yea, seven are abomination unto him. A proud look, a lying tongue, and hands that shed innocent blood, and heart that deviseth wicked imaginations, feet that be swift in running to mischief, a false witness that speaketh lies, and he that soweth discord among brethren. What's the first thing that's mentioned? A proud look. Proverbs chapter 18. <clears throat> Proverbs chapter 18, verses 11 and 12. Proverbs 18, verses 11 and 12. The rich man's wealth is his strong city and as an high wall in his own conceit. Before destruction, the heart of man is haughty. There's that word again. And before honor is humility. Pride. Pride. I'm
I'm going to be honest with you. I struggle with pride. And I am the least of all saints. I have nothing to be proud of. But only shame. All right. This uh, video is more for Christians because I'm going to tell you something, and I have a lot of experience with this and dealing with other brethren who are saved but run into the issue of pride. And even lost people know that if you're talking about yourself or boasting yourself, it's very ugly. It's very ugly. And we as Christians, as Bible-believing Christians, know that what? What do we know as Christians? What did we just read? Huh? What did we just read? <laughs> we know that as Christians, pride goeth before destruction. This is Proverbs 16, verse 18. Pride goeth before destruction and a haughty spirit before a fall. And in Proverbs 18, verse 12, Before destruction the heart of man is haughty, and before honor is humility. And also we know as Christians, <clears throat> in the Proverbs 6, verse 16 and 17, These six things doth the Lord hate, yea, seven are an abomination unto him, a proud look. A lying tongue and hands that shed innocent blood. You can read the rest of the verses yourself. We as Christians know that pride has no place in our life. At least we ought to know. But what can happen is people can take pride in their accomplishments as a Christian. People can boast of their blessings rather than boasting the one who gave them their blessings. I've mentioned this before, but today I'm really going to attack this because, you know, if you are self-righteous, you're in big trouble with the Lord. And in your conversations... As a Christian now, I'm not talking about the lost world, but as a Christian, if you draw everything in your conversation back to the center, which is you, which ought to be, though, the Lord Jesus Christ, what he did for you on the cross, and his word, the King James Bible, but if you are bringing everything back to yourself, shifting every conversation back to you, the center, because you are the king of all things, you have a very serious pride issue. I know, because I struggle with it myself. And we are going to look in depth at this issue of pride. Okay? We're going to see where pride came from, we're going to look at examples of people who were proud, and we're also going to see the cure for pride. We're going to look at three aspects of this, okay? We're going to be in the Old Testament and in the New Testament. And remember what it says in Romans chapter 15, verse 4, that all things that were written aforetime were written for our learning that we through patience and hope may take comfort through the scriptures. I just paraphrased that and butchered it a little bit. Forgive me. Romans 15 verse 4. Go look it up. Okay? We're going to learn some things about pride today. And God hates it. There is no excuse for us to boast. You might be thinking to yourself, well, hey, mess a boogie. Paul did a little boasting in his epistles. He did. But when you, and you can look this up on your own time, okay, when Paul did any boasting of himself or the ministry that God had given him, it was because people were 
attacking him and questioning his validity and authority as a Christ-appointed apostle. You can look that up yourself on your own time, okay? Whenever Paul did any of his boasting, it was in his self-defense because he was being questioned. Not because he was telling the sinner how great he was because God had made him thus. That's disgusting, and Paul never did that. And I personally know of Christians who are saved, but yet bring everything back to the center of themselves. Psychology, which, it, which I reject, they have a very interesting phrase for that. It's called a shift response. Okay, I don't promote that, but it's very interesting. A shift response is where what I was just talking about. Whenever you're in a conversation with someone and you always bring the conversation to glorify yourself in one way or another, that's called a shift response. Okay, that's what that is. Like I said, I don't promote psychology or anything like that, but very interesting. Now, let's begin. What is pride? Obviously, we know that it's vaulting of oneself, lifting up oneself, puffing up oneself. Okay? Where did pride begin? Where did pride begin? Ezekiel, in your Old Testament, chapter 28. Okay? Ezekiel chapter 28 in your King James Bible. Now, like I always say, on your own time, go ahead and read the whole chapter of Ezekiel 28. It's 26 verses, okay? Read it on your own time so you can get the whole context, okay? But we're going to be reading in Ezekiel chapter 28, verses 12 on to verse 19. Okay? Go there. Come on. <clears throat> Ezekiel chapter 28. What's pride? Where did it come from? Let's read. Ezekiel chapter 28, beginning at verse 12, and we will be re reading on to verse 19. Beginning at verse 12. Son of man, Take up a lamentation upon the king of Tyrus, and say unto him, Thus saith the Lord God, Thou sealest up the sun, full of wisdom and perfect in beauty. Thou hast been in Eden, the garden of God. Now, was Tyrus in the garden of Eden? No, he wasn't. Who was in the Garden of Eden? Adam, Eve, of course the Lord, but there was one other person in the Garden of Eden. Hold your place here. If you're a Bible-believing, King James Bible-believing Christian, this is uh, should be a no-brainer, but I want to show you who is this other person who was in the Garden of Eden? Genesis chapter 3, beginning at verse 1. Now the serpent was more subtle than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. And he said unto the woman, Yea, hath God said, You shall not eat of every tree of the garden, and the woman said unto the serpent, The serpent is the devil. That old serpent, the devil, and Satan. And the woman said unto the serpent, We may eat of the fruit of the trees of the garden, but of the fruit of the tree which is in the midst of the garden, God has said, Ye shall not eat of it, neither shall ye touch it, lest ye die. God didn't say that. Lest ye die, neither shall ye touch it, lest ye die. Okay? And the serpent said unto the woman, Ye shall not surely die. 
For God doth know that in the day ye eat thereof, then your eyes shall be opened, and ye shall be as gods, knowing good and evil. So the serpent appealed to the pride of Eve, of Eve, excuse me, that eating this fruit of the tree will make their eyes open, and they shall be as gods, knowing good and evil. The devil appealed to pride. Now go back to Ezekiel 28. We're at verse 13 still. Thou hast been in the in Eden, the garden of God. We just I just showed you that he's talking about the devil. Okay, the devil was in control of Tyrus. The devil was giving Tyrus his you know whatever. Okay, and the Lord was going through Tyrus directly attacking the source behind Tyrus, that old serpent, the devil, Satan. Okay? Thou hast been in Eden, the garden of God. Every precious stone was thy covering, the sardius, topaz, and the diamond, the beryl, the onyx, and the jasper, the sapphire, the emerald, and the carbuncle, and gold. The workmanship of thy tablets and of thy pipes was prepared in the day that was prepared in thee, excuse me, in the day that thou wast created. Or they, they, now see, there's a whole lot of stuff going on in that verse right there. Okay? A whole lot of stuff. First of all, we see all these precious stones that this devil, Satan, Lucifer, we'll get to that, was adorned with. All these precious stones, gold. Also here, the workmanship of thy tablets and of thy pipes was prepared in thee in the day that thou wast created. Satan, you know, there, the, there's the argument that Satan was God's choir director. Um, that's hinted to in the text, but it is not specifically stated as such in Scripture. Okay? But the obvious is that Satan has something to do with music. Case in point, look at modern music today. That's enough said. But notice also, in the, in the day that thou wast created, Satan, Lucifer before the fall. Lucifer means light bearer. Lucifer before the fall. He was a created being. He is not self-existent. Okay. Excuse me. He is not self-existent. Uh, he is not omnipresent. He can't be everywhere at every moment. Okay. He was a created being. He is a created being. Okay. Remember that about the devil. Verse 14. Thou art the anointed cherub that covereth, and I have set thee so. Thou wast upon the holy mountain of God. Thou hast walked up and down in the midst of the stones of fire. Okay. At one time, Lucifer had good fellowship with the Lord. Verse 15. Thou wast perfect in thy ways from the day that thou was created. Okay? That's twice in three verses where it's referenced that Lucifer, Satan, is a created being. <clears throat> thou wast perfect in thy ways from the day that thou was created until till iniquity was found in thee. Iniquity was found in him. What is this iniquity? Let's keep reading. By the multitude of thy merchandise, they have filled the midst of thee with violence, and thou hast sinned. Therefore I will cast thee as profane out of the mountain of God, and I will destroy thee, O covering cherub, from the midst of the stones of fire. Watch this. Thine heart was lifted up because of thy Beauty. 
Thou hast corrupted thy wisdom by reason of thy brightness. I will cast thee to the ground. I will lay thee before kings that they may behold thee. Okay, now, now let's read this again. Verse 17. Thine heart was lifted up because of thy beauty. You see here in verse 13, every precious stone was thy covering. Satan is not this ugly, pea soup vomiting, head turning, black eyed, skeletal, uh, hooved horn, pitchfork being. No, 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 no. Satan is a beautiful, angelic being. Why do you think that sin looks so beautiful sometimes? Hmm? Why do you think if a devil, or if you're unfortunate enough that the devil himself will be tempting you actually, oh boy, but when you are tempted with sin, have you ever wondered why at the moment sin looks so appealing and so beautiful? Huh? Have you ever wondered that? Satan is a beautiful creature, a beautiful creation. And Hollywood has tried to make you think that Satan is something he is not. No, Satan is beautiful. He is very beautiful. Probably one of the most beautiful things that the Lord ever made. Satan, Lucifer. We're in verse 17. Thou hast corrupted thy wisdom by reason of thy brightness. We're going to read in Isaiah chapter 14 after this that Lucifer thought that he could replace God, that he could be on the same level as God. Okay? He was captivated with his own beauty. He... Thou hast corrupted thy wisdom by reason of thy brightness. He thought he could be God himself. And as we saw in Genesis chapter 3, he brought that pride to the garden and tempted Eve. Ye can be as gods, knowing good and evil. Okay? The sin of Satan is pride. Pride in any form. There is no such thing as good pride. The sin of Satan was pride. Now, to instruct us in righteousness, Christian, has the Lord adorned you with many gifts? Has the Lord blessed you with abundance of food, a roof over your head, a job to pay for your bills and your wife and your kids if you got those? Hmm? Is the Lord sustaining thee? And then when you go to a lost person or to a brother or sister who is in total lack, do you make yourself look disgusting by saying, look at how the Lord hath blessed me? Huh? Do you defile your own self by your own brightness, Christian? Hmm? Think about that. For instruction in righteousness. I've said this many times, but we're looking at the example of it. If you are boasting yourself through God, and not God through you. Thine heart was lifted up because of thy beauty. Thou hast corrupted thy wisdom by reason of thy brightness. 
And look at the punishment. I will cast thee to the ground. I will lay thee before kings that they may behold thee. Verse 18. Thou hast defiled thy sanctuaries by the multitude of thine iniquities, by the iniquity of thy traffic. Therefore will I bring forth a fire from the midst of thee. It shall devour thee. And I will bring thee to ashes upon the earth in the sight of all them that behold thee. And they that know thee among the people shall be astonished at thee. Thou shalt be a terror, and never shalt thou be anymore. And eventually Satan, Lucifer, is going to be put in the lake of fire forever. Okay? Satan is going to go to hell himself and be tormented and burned forever and ever and ever and ever. Okay? That's where pride came from. Now go to Isaiah chapter 14. Here's where you're really going to need a King James Bible. Now, the context is about King of Babylon. Okay? But, I mean, you can read the whole context. Okay? Read the whole context on your own time. We are going to be reading in Isaiah chapter 14, verses 12 on to 14. Now, you're going to hear a phrase, I will. Count how many times you will hear the word, the phrase, I will. Okay? Isaiah chapter 14, verses 12 on to 14, beginning at verse 12. How art thou fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning? How art thou cut down to the ground which didst weaken the nations? Now watch this. For thou hast said in thine heart, I will ascend into heaven. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. I will sit also upon the mount of the congregation in the sides of the north. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will be like the Most High. Five times. You know, there's a Satanist out there who is a mind control expert. His name is Tony Robbins. His motto is, success is doing what you want to do, when you want, as much as you want, with whom you want, whenever you want. Five. Okay? That's not a coincidence because Mr. Tony Robbins is a minister of Satan himself. He is a Satanist. But I'm not going to get off on that. Okay? But there are five I wills. Let's read those again. Verses 13 and 14. In Isaiah chapter 14, For thou hast said in thine heart, I will ascend into heaven. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. I will sit also upon the mount of the congregation in the sides of the north. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will be like the Most High. Satan, Lucifer, has an ego problem. Yeah. Need any more proof? The sin of the devil is pride. And in, uh, in the books of Timothy, about a bishop or an overseer, where Paul says, not a, novice, lest they, not a novice, lest they fall into the condemnation of the devil. The condemnation of the devil is pride. Okay? Verse 12 again. How art thou fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning? But now, now let's read this now. Verse 15. Yet thou shalt be brought down to hell. To the sides of the pit. Verse 16. 
that they that they that see thee shall narrowly look upon thee and consider thee, saying, Is this the man that made the earth to tremble and did shake kingdoms? Verse 15 again. Yet thou shalt be brought down to hell, to the sides of the pit. See, Satan is going to hell. And he's going to never get out, and he's going to burn forever, guys, okay? That's the beginning in history of pride. Pride is satanic. Now, we as Christians can struggle with pride. Doesn't mean that we are satanic. Okay? But, because of the fall in the Garden of Eden, okay? Because we all share in the similitude of the transgression of Adam, we all struggle with pride. And you know what? If you say, oh, I don't struggle with pride, Mr. Boogie, you're a liar. And you're showing your pride by saying that. Okay? Put this for instruction and righteousness for us, the Christian of today. Put this into a perspective, Christian. Who are you to boast of what the Lord hath given you? Do you realize how disgusting and grotesque and ugly you are when you fall into pride and start boasting you over the Lord? That you're boasting you through the Lord. I know, I know of people who do that. I believe they're saved, but they are so full of themselves. They are so narcissistic, and narcissism is not a King James Bible word. But they are so arrogant, so puffed up, so full of themselves, so full of pride. And they say they're Christians. Now granted, a Christian can struggle with pride. Okay? Peter did. Paul did. But see, you number one have to know that you have a problem with pride. It's only when you realize and confess <laughs> Lord, I got a big pride problem. Humble me. <laughs> Help me, please, because I can't do it. Help me to overcome this pride of mine. Okay? That's where pride came from. Satan, the devil. Now we're going to look at an example of this in the Old Testament. Turn in your King James Bible to Second Chronicles. On a personal note, 1st and 2nd Samuel, 1st and 2nd Kings, 1st and 2nd Chronicles, I love reading those uh, six books because there is a lot of instruction in righteousness for us and there are so many types for us to learn from in the books of Samuel, Kings, and Chronicles. We can learn so much for us today. Not doctrine, but examples for us to learn from, okay? The, the books of Samuel, Kings, and Chronicles are very rich in instruction for righteousness for us. They really are. And looking at the past kings of Israel, sure learn a whole lot of stuff about Joseph and about certain types of Christians, okay? Now, <clears throat> excuse me. We are going to start in 2 Chronicles chapter 26. Now, 2 Chronicles chapter 26 is precisely 23 verses. Okay? On your own time, read the entire chapter to get the entire context. Okay? This is talking about King Uzziah. Okay? 
King Uzziah. And King Uzziah was pretty much a good king, okay? He was a great king. He was a godly king. But Uzziah fell into the sin of pride, okay? Now, like I said, read the whole chapter on your own time for the entire context. Right now, for the point of this video, we're going to be reading in... 2 Chronicles chapter 26, verses 15 on to verse 20. Okay? Now you have to remember, King Uzziah was a great king. Okay? He had a lot of stuff. He did a lot of things. But, now watch this. 2 Chronicles chapter 26, beginning at verse 15 on to verse 20. Okay? This isn't for instruction in righteousness for us today. Not doctrine. But instruction and in righteousness. Let's read. Beginning at verse 15. And he made in Jerusalem, he being King Uzziah, engines invented by cunning men to be on the towers and upon the bulwarks to shoot arrows and great stones withal. And his name spread far abroad, for he was marvelously helped. Till he was strong. Get that one, Christian. Till he was strong. Till he was strong. Now Jesus talks about in his parable about the rich guy who, who had so much stuff that uh, he tore down his old barns to make bigger barns so he could put more stuff into it. Okay? Are you needs driven or do you have so much stuff that you just don't need anything? That's why I've said before, I really feel bad for rich people who are Christians because they got a heck of a lot harder than we poor folk who need every day for the Lord to provide us our sustenance when those who are rich can, well, Pierce them, can ear from the faith, and pierce themselves through with many sorrows. <laughs> but look at that again. For he was marvelously helped till he was strong. Pride! Okay? Pride came into King Uzziah. Now, he was marvelously helped. You need to read the context on your own time, because this is going to be another long video. Watch what happens because of his pride. Okay, keep in your mind what we read in Ezekiel chapter 28. Okay, watch this. Verse 16. But when he was strong, King Uzziah, his heart was lifted up to his destruction. For he transgressed against the Lord his God and went into the temple of the Lord to burn incense upon the altar of incense. Now see, this is a different dispensation. The Levitical priests were the only ones allowed to do that. Aaron, okay, and his line, the Levitical priesthood, the Aaronic priesthood, okay, they were the only ones who were allowed to do that. And King Uzziah here, because he was so strong, thought, well, I don't need these guys. I can do that because look at me. Look at me. I'm somebody. What do I need a priest for? I'm King Uzziah. Ah, la, 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 you know? <coughs> Verse 17. And Azariah the priest went in after him, and with him four score priests. Two, four, six, eight. Okay? Eighty priests. Twenty, forty, sixty, eighty. 80 priests. And Azariah the priest went in after him, and with him fourscore priests of the Lord that were valiant men. Okay? These guys are like, whoa, 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 hey, yo, whoa, stop, time out, what are you doing? Watch this. Verse 18. And they withstood Uzziah the king, and said unto him, It appertaineth not unto thee 
Uzziah, to burn incense unto the Lord, but to the priests, the sons of Aaron, that are consecrated to burn incense, go out of the sanctuary, for thou hast trespassed, neither shall it be for thine honor from the Lord God. That's that that verse is pretty self-explanatory, isn't it? Okay. Watch what happens. Verse 19. Then Uzziah was wroth, mad, and had a censer in his hand to burn incense. And while he was wroth with the priests, the leprosy even rose up in his forehead before the priests in the house of the Lord from beside the incense altar. So the Lord boop, smote Uzziah with leprosy right then and there, just like that, in front of the priests. And it came up on his forehead, and the priest saw it. Like a, you done messed up big time, Uzziah. The priest, and notice how... It says in verse 17 that Azra, 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 excuse me, I'm tripping on my own tongue, the priest went in after him, and with him four score priests of the Lord that were valiant men. Okay? They went in to stop King Uzziah. The Lord had grace, gave him a chance to repent, to change and get out of there before it was too late. But what happened? Uzziah was mad. In verse 19. And then, because he was like, I'm the king. Why are you, what, what, how dare you talk to me like that? I'm King Uzziah. I have been marvelously helped. Haven't you heard of me? Let me put this kind of thing in perspective. And I've heard this before from Christians, and it made my skin crawl. I feel like the Apostle Paul for all the people I have led to the Lord Jesus Christ. I've actually heard people say that. Oh, the Lord has blessed me. God is using me so much. God just keeps blessing me. Now, it's okay to boast the Lord through you. But see, when you do it just like that, you know, you are the focus, not the Lord. The Lord is your fulcrum, so you could say, to boast, not the other way around. Boasting, <laughs> and yeah, the Lord used me of all people to do this. I don't know why the Lord gave me all this, because I'm no good. I'm not worth anything. You know? <laughs> Praise the Lord that he has given me, of all people, this. No, no. But what do you hear sometime? I feel like the Apostle Paul, because of all the people I have led to the Lord. Look at me. Look at me. Have any of you run into that from fellow Christians? Yeah, it's pretty disgusting, isn't it? And the Lord will bring you down to hell unless you repent. Okay? Doesn't mean, I'm not saying that you're going to lose your salvation because we are eternally secure. But the Lord is just going to go hog wild on you and whip you or take his hand off you and let your pride destroy yourself. For the destruction of the flesh that the spirit may be saved in the day of the Lord Jesus. Verse 20. And Azariah the chief priest and all the priests looked upon him. And behold, he was leprous in his forehead. And they thrust him out thence. Yea, himself hastened also to go out because the Lord had smitten him. In verse 21, we're going to read, And Uzziah the king was a leper unto the day of his death, and dwelt in a several house, being a leper, for he was cut off from the house of the Lord. And Jotham, his son, was over the king's house, judging the people of the land. That's pretty instructive for us today, isn't it? I'll 
also want to I also want to address while we're here because like I said I love reading about the kings and in the chronicles and kings and Samuel okay go ahead a little bit to chapter 32 King Hezekiah we're going to look at now hold your place here in second chronicles chapter 32 okay hold your place there and go to second kings chapter 20 okay second kings chapter 20 the story the tale of uh hezekiah is told in second kings second chronicles and also in isaiah the prophet the son of amaz okay so go to second kings chapter 20 okay now hezekiah was made sick and he was going to die and hezekiah prayed on to the lord like i don't want to die please don't let me die give me some more time and the lord hearkened unto him and gave him 15 or what was it uh 13 or 15 years more okay uh, thus said the Lord, I have heard thy prayer, and I seen there, behold, I, uh, I will heal thee. Fifteen years, okay, excuse me for that. It was fifteen more years the Lord added to Hezekiah after Hezekiah wept and prayed unto the Lord and asked him for a little bit more time in life. It's during this time, during that 15-year period, that one of the worst kings in the history of, uh, history of Israel was born. King Manasseh, okay, and coincidentally, which coincidences don't exist, in Second Chronicles chapter thirty-three, you read about Manasseh, but we're not going to do that, okay? But it's during this time, that fifteen-year period, that one of Israel's worst kings ever, Manasseh, was born. Okay, now that's the backstory of King Hezekiah. Of course, you could read uh, 2 Kings chapter 20 on your own time for the context, and also 2 Chronicles chapter 32 for the context of that. But let's go on this, okay? We're going to be in 2 Kings chapter 20, verses 14 on to verse 19, okay? Let's read. 2 Kings chapter 20, verses 14 on to verse 19. This is for instruction in righteousness, by the way. I'm not teaching you doctrine. We are to learn from this. Okay? We're going to be getting into the, uh, the New Testament and the Pauline epistles, but you need to see. You need to see this. Okay? So, verse 14 on to verse 19. Then came Isaiah the prophet unto King Hezekiah and said unto him, what said these men? And from whence came they unto thee? And Hezekiah said, They are come from a far country, even from Babylon. Very quickly, after Hezekiah was healed, the Lord gave him a sign, and ambassadors from Babylon came to Hezekiah to see him, because they heard that the Lord had healed him and wanted to see the blessing, and the miracle, and stuff like that, okay? So these... Uh, ambassadors from Babylon came to see King Hezekiah. That's what that's talking about. Verse 15, And he said, What have they seen in thy house? And Hezekiah answered, All the things that are in mine house have they seen. There is nothing among my treasures that I have not shewed them. <sighs> oh boy, can you feel that there, Christian? What have they seen in thine house? And Hezekiah answered, All the things that are in mine house have they seen. Look at this. Look at me. Look at The Lord has just blessed me. I am so blessed and wealthy. Verse 16. And Isaiah said unto Hezekiah, Hear the word of the Lord. Verse 17. Behold, the days come that all that is in thine house and that which thy fathers have laid up in store unto this day shall be carried into Babylon. 
nothing shall be left, saith the Lord. And of thy sons that shall issue from thee, which thou shalt beget, they shall take away, and they shall be eunuchs in the palace of the king of Babylon. And that happened. You can read about that in Daniel. Watch this. Now, we're going to see here in Second Chronicles chapter 32 that Hezekiah repented of his pride. But see, he was never the same after he was given that 15 years. Okay? He was never the same. I do believe, of course, that Hezekiah is in heaven, that we will see him in heaven, of course. I actually believe that his son Manasseh is in heaven as well. But that's beside the point. Watch this response. Verse 19. Then said Hezekiah unto Isaiah, Good is the word of the Lord which thou hast spoken. And he said, Is it not good if peace and truth be in my days? Now some will argue and say that, well, Hezekiah was being grateful that he's not bringing destruction upon his people at that present time. And you can you can legitimately make that argument. But within the context of what we just read, it's kind of, I mean, he did humble himself. We're going to see that. But it's like still a little clingy. It's like, is it not good if peace and truth be in my days? <clears throat> Second Chronicles chapter 32. Okay, we're going to read first verses 24 on to verse 26, and then we are going to read verse 31. Okay, Second Chronicles chapter 32, we're going to begin at verse 24 and read on to verse 26, then we're going to skip a little and ver read verse 31. Okay, we read verse 24. In those days Hezekiah was sick to death. And prayed unto the Lord, and he spake unto him, and he gave him a sign. But Hezekiah rendered not again according to the benefit done unto him, for his heart was lifted up. Therefore there was wrath upon him and upon Judah and Jerusalem. Notwithstanding, Hezekiah humbled himself for the pride of his heart, both he and the inhabitants of Jerusalem, so that the wrath of the Lord came not upon them in the days of Hezekiah. Okay? Now, looking at verse 31, Howbeit in the business of the ambassadors of the princes of Babylon, who sent unto him to inquire of the wonder that was done in the land, God left him to try him, that he might know all that was in his heart. The he is not God. The he is Hezekiah. Okay? The he is Hezekiah, not God. God knows everything, okay? Hezekiah had pride. And God left him to show Hezekiah what was in his own heart. And Hezekiah took that. But we also see, but Hezekiah rendered not again according to the benefit done unto him. He, he humbled himself and repented. But he was never the same after that, because of his pride. Now we're going to the New Testament. I, I have to throw this in, okay? John chapter 5. John chapter 5. We're going to read verse 41 on to verse 44. John chapter 5. Beginning at verse 41 on to verse 44. I have to throw this in here. This is God manifest in the flesh, our Lord Jesus Christ speaking. I receive not honor from men. But I know you, that ye have not the love of God in you. I am come in my Father's name, and ye receive me not. 
If another shall come in his own name, him ye will receive. How can ye believe, which receive honor one of another, and seek not the honor that cometh from God only? Now, go to Romans chapter 16. In the Pauline epistles, is specifically written for us in the church age. Are you there? Romans chapter 16. Now we're going to be looking at some of the ways that we are to deal with pride within ourselves and also with other brethren. Okay, like I said, I'm addressing saved, born-again, King James Bible-believing Christians. I'm addressing the saved right now. And for you, those of you who may be lost watching this, for the love of our Lord Jesus Christ, consider your ways at least, okay? So, Romans chapter 16, verses 17 on to verse 19. Beginning at verse 17. Now I beseech you, brethren, mark them which cause divisions and offenses contrary to the doctrine which ye have learned, and what? Avoid them. The doctrine. The death, burial, and resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. That ye are saved by grace through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. Interesting. <clears throat> Watch this. For they that are such serve not our Lord Jesus Christ, but their own belly, and by good words and fair speeches deceive the hearts of the simple. For your obedience has come abroad unto all men. I am glad, therefore, on your behalf, but yet I would have you wise unto that which is good and simple concerning evil. What does it mean to be simple concerning evil? Calling sin, sin. And calling what is good, righteous, holy, good. Okay? Call sin, sin. Okay? Don't water down sin. It's a sin. Call it sin and stop it. Okay? Don't be like, well, the Greek says, well, it was a different... Shut your mouth! Call sin, sin. Call that which is good, good. Cleave to that which is good and abhor, extremely hate that which is evil. According to Scripture, you. According to Scripture. See... People who are Christian, who are saved, and are struggling with pride, they're not serving the Lord Jesus Christ, even though they're saved. I'm talking about saved people who are struggling with pride now, okay? But they're serving their own belly, okay? You can be saved and not serve the Lord. You ain't going to get nowhere, okay? You ain't going to have no rewards up in heaven, but once you truly call on the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, once you come to him as a broken, contrite sinner, okay, that's called repentance, okay, and call on him and believe here that he died, buried, and rose again the third day according to the scriptures, and that his blood cleanses you from all sin, you are saved. You are eternally secure. You are sealed until the day of redemption. You are sealed with that Holy Spirit of promise, okay? You're saved. Done. But you run into pride, you run into this, you run into that. You can amount to nothing. Sometimes it happens. Okay? You know, if you run into someone who is a, a Christian, you know they're saved, and um, they run into pride, and you talk to them about it, you rebuke them once, 
or admonish them, excuse me, admonish them once, admonish them twice, and if they won't take that correction, you know, get some members of the church, the body, not the building, talk to them, and then you know what, you know what, it's like, hand such a one over unto Satan for the destruction of the flesh, that the spirit may be saved in the day of the Lord Jesus. Now, 1 Corinthians chapter 4. First Corinthians chapter 4. We're going to be reading verses 6, 7, and 8 in 1 Corinthians chapter 4. Read, like I've, I've read this before, read the whole chapter for the context. Okay. 1 Corinthians chapter 4, verses 6 and 7. Okay. All right, 6 through 8. Excuse me. And these things, brethren, beginning at verse 6 in uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 4. And these things, brethren, have I, ha I have in a figure transferred to myself and to Apollos for your sakes, that ye might learn in us not to think of men above that which is written, that no one of you be puffed up for one against another. For who maketh thee to differ from another? And what hast thou that thou didst not receive? Now if thou didst receive it, why dost thou glory as if thou hadst not received it? Meaning that you got it on your own. Verse 8, Now ye are full, now ye are rich. Ye have reigned as kings without us. And I would to God ye did reign, that we might, that we also might reign with you. Paul's sarcasm. Okay? Now I've read before to you verses 9 through 13. But look at verse 18 and 19 and 20. Actually, look at verses 18 through 21. Now, we're skipping a little in here in 1 Corinthians chapter 4. Look at this. Beginning at verse 18 on to verse 21. Now, some are puffed up as though I would not come to you, but I will come to you shortly, if the Lord will, and will know not the speech of them which are puffed up, but the power. For the kingdom of God is not in word, but in power. What will ye? Shall I come unto you with a rod, or in love, or in the spirit of meekness? You know, you could speak a whole lot of words, but if you aren't saved, if you don't have the Holy Ghost dwelling within you, <laughs> a fool is known by the multitude of words. That's in the book of Ecclesiastes, just so you know. Okay? Do you walk your talk? Are the words coming from the Holy Ghost? Are your words coming from the King James Bible? God's preserved perfect word? Hmm? Now, go to Galatians. did have a lot more notes here, but I'm already at an hour, and I don't want to make this too long. Too late there, Mr. Boogie. <laughs> Galatians chapter 6. Very quickly. One verse here. For if a man think himself to be something, when he is nothing, he deceiveth himself. Verse 4. But let every man prove his own work, and then shall he have rejoicing in himself alone, and not in another. Now, let's look at some of these. What is the cure? What is the cure for pride? What is the cure for pride? Turn to 2 Corinthians chapter 12. Some very popular verses, but I want you to think about something. Paul wrote 
given by inspiration of the Holy Ghost, the Spirit of God, God, through Paul, wrote the majority of the New Testament. Okay? Paul was mightily used of God. And as I said earlier, the only time Paul boasted himself or his works, it is because he was being questioned and his authority was being questioned. Okay? That's the only time Paul did it. Okay? He wasn't going out with bravado and boasting himself like a fool. Okay? He did it only when he was questioned. Okay? And when you think about it, friends, think about this. If anyone could have had a pride problem, think about it. Paul, the apostle, look at what the Lord did through him. Look at what we are reading right now, today. Look at the life of Paul. Look at how the Lord used him. Just look at what his ministry, his writings that the Holy Ghost did through him, okay? If someone could have had an issue with pride, it sure could have been the Apostle Paul. Wouldn't you agree? So let's watch this. 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verses 7 on to verse 10. Beginning at verse 7. And lest I should be exalted above measure through the abundance of the revelations, there was given to me a thorn in the flesh, the messenger of Satan to buffet me, lest I should be exalted above measure. <laughs> okay? A humbling agent to buffet him. What did the text just say? For this thing I besought the Lord thrice. Thrice means three. That it might depart from me. And he said unto me, My grace is sufficient for thee. For my strength, my strength is made perfect in weakness. Most gladly, therefore, will I, will I rather glory in my infirmities, that the power of Christ may rest upon me. Therefore I take pleasure in infirmities, in reproaches, in necessities, in persecutions, in distresses for Christ's sake. For when I am weak, then am I strong. That's the proper perspective. Paul admits, hey, I could be, I mean, look at it. Look at the Pauline epistles. <coughs> Excuse me. Look at the life of Paul in general. Okay? A thorn was given to him in his flesh. You know, we all have that, right? We all have a thorn in our flesh. Those of us who are truly saved and born again. King James Bible believing Christians. We all have a thorn. What's yours? Do you embrace your thorn? Hmm? Because the purpose of the thorn is to keep you needs driven. To keep you humble. So that when you talk to the Lord about it, He can say, my grace is sufficient for thee. For my strength is made perfect in weakness. The thorn in Paul's life, what it was, I don't know. Some say it was blindness. I've heard some pretty perverse things from false prophets. I don't know what it was. With his eyesight vision kind of thing, I personally kind of leaned more towards that because of the scales on his eyes, but that's besides the point. It's not name, but the point is he had it to keep him humble so he wouldn't be all cocky and proud and puffed up. Okay? Okay? Verse 10. Therefore I take pleasure in infirmities and reproaches and necessities and persecutions and distresses for Christ's sake. For when I am weak, then I am strong. The moment you realize that you are nothing, that you are no good, <laughs> that you are a sinner, that you are a saved sinner if you are truly saved and born again, that you can't do anything without the Lord. It's when you get to a point where you don't 
need you that you think you don't need the Lord, that you are self-sufficient. That's when pride comes in. We saw that in the book of Chronicles. Okay? People who were marvelously helped until they were strong. People who were given great gifts by God, but yes, turned them into boasting. Okay? Christian, are you taken by your own brightness? Hmm? Are your own coverings that God has given you the, the diamond, the barrel, the topaz, the the sound of thy pipes and tablets, the, the sound you like to hear the sound of your own voice in your conversation, Christian? First Peter Chapter five. First Peter Chapter five. This is some of the cure for pride. First Peter Chapter five, verses six on to verse ten. Beginning at verse six. 1 Peter chapter 5. Humble yourselves therefore under the mighty hand of God, that he may exalt you in due time, casting all your care upon him, for he careth for you. Be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary the devil, as a roaring lion, walketh about, who, walketh about seeking whom he may devour. Verse 9. Whom resist steadfast, in the faith, knowing that the same afflictions are accomplished in your brethren that are in the world. But the God of all grace, who hath called us unto his eternal glory by Christ Jesus, after that ye have suffered a while, make you perfect, establish, strengthen, settle you. And verse 11, to him be glory and dominion forever. And ever. Amen. Amen. Go back to Philippians chapter 2. Philippians chapter 2, verses 1 under verse 11. Philippians chapter 2, verses 1 on to verse 11. How much time was it? Oh boy. Okay. Beginning at verse 1. If there be therefore any consolation in Christ, if any comfort of love, if any fellowship of the Spirit, if any bowels of mercy, mercies, fulfill ye my joy, that ye be like-minded, having the same love, being of one accord, of one mind. Let nothing be done through strife or vain glory, but in lowliness of mind. Let each esteem other better than themselves. Look not every man on his own things, but every man also on the things of others. Look not every man on his own things, but every man also on the things of others. Look not every man on his own things, but every man also on the things of others. Do you get it? Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. Now, verse 6 here, the New, the new Modern Bible perversions, Satanic Roman Catholic Bibles, <laughs> destroy this verse, okay? Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. Verse 6, who, being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God, but 
made himself of no reputation, and took upon him the form of a servant, and was made in the likeness of men. God the Father, God the creator of heaven and earth, God manifest in the flesh, humbled himself, and walked as man amongst us. Verse 8, And being found in fashion as a man, he humbled himself, and became obedient unto death, even the death of a cross, of the cross, excuse me. Do you realize that it was God on the cross who died for you? Do you really understand that? Wherefore, God also hath highly exalted him, and given him a name which is above every name. That at the name of Yeshua, <coughs> excuse me, Yahashua, <coughs> Yehoshua, <coughs> excuse me, no, it's Jesus. Jesus. That at the name of Jesus every knee should bow of things in heaven and things on earth and things under the earth. And that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. I had a lot more to talk to you about, but I think, I hope, I pray you get the point. Proverbs chapter 3 Proverbs chapter 3 verses 31 on to verse 35 Proverbs chapter 3 verses 31 on to verse 35 to close out that chapter Envy thou uh, beginning at verse 31 Envy thou not the oppressor and choose none of his ways for the froward is abomination to the Lord, but his secret is with the righteous. The curse of the Lord is in the house of the wicked, but he blesseth the habitation of the just. Surely he scorneth the scorners, but he giveth grace unto the lowly. The wise shall inherit glory, but shame shall be the promotion of fools. You got time for one more, Christian? You got time for one more? Huh? You know, I don't know if anybody's going to see this. I really don't care. I lay hey, for you, my five lovely subscribers. Thank you. I love you guys. But uh, I'm not doing this to get likes or to get views. I have to do this. Anyway, Colossians chapter 3. Colossians chapter 3, beginning at verse 12 unto verse 17. Then we'll be done. Colossians chapter 3, beginning at verse 12 unto verse 17. Beginning at verse 12. Put on, therefore, as the elect of God, holy and beloved, bowels of mercy, kindness, humbleness of mind, meekness, long-suffering, forbearing one another, and forgiving one another. If any man have a quarrel against any, even as Christ forgave you, so also do ye. He's talking to believers. Okay? He's talking to fellow believers. And above all these things, put on charity, which is the bond of perfectness. Charity, self-sacrifice, giving of yourself. Because you can sure love all the wrong things, friends. 
Charity is denying of self and self-sacrifice. You can love the wrong thing. Charity is the right reading. And let the peace of God rule in your hearts, to the which also ye are called in one body, and be ye thankful. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly in all wisdom, teaching and admonishing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing with grace in your hearts to the Lord. And whatsoever ye do in word or deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God and the Father by him. Humble yourself. Well, friends, take from this what you will. Um, like I've said, I myself struggle with pride. Um, I also confess that I have struggles dealing with people who struggle with pride. <laughs> but uh, there's no place for pride as a Christian. And no matter how you mask it, how you hide it, it is wrong and it is of the devil. And, you know, we all have a thorn in our flesh. And our thorn, as we saw in Scripture, as it was for the Apostle Paul, excuse me, we all have one. Embrace it. Because um, he who glorieth, let him glory in the Lord. For in these things, saith the Lord, do I delight. Beware of pride, Christian. Beware of boasting yourself through the Lord and not the Lord through yourself. Because no one's going to get up in heaven or before the judgment seat of Christ and say, well, I, I can't wait to get, get my rewards because I was so good. Uh -huh. No. Beware of pride. Thank you very much for watching. If you did, you have yourself a nice day.